We are reading from the Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 1, Chapter 15, Text 44. The Sanskrit is Udichim Pravivesha Sham Gata Purvang Mahat Mabihi Riddhi Brahma Parangyayam Navateta Yato Gataha. Translation He, King Yudhishthir, then started towards the north, treating the path accepted by his forefathers and great men to devote himself completely to the thought of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and he lived in that way wherever he went. Purport. It is understood from this verse that Maharaja Yudhishthir followed in the footsteps of his forefathers and the great devotees of the Lord. We have discussed many times before that the system of Varnashrama Dharma as it was strictly followed by the inhabitants of the world, specifically by those who inhabited the Aryavarta province of the world, emphasizes the importance of leaving all household connections at a certain stage of life. The training and education was so imparted and thus a respectable person like Maharaja Yudhishthir had to leave all family connection for self-realization and going back to Godhead. No king or respectable gentleman would continue. I'm sorry, would continue family life till the end, because that was considered suicidal and against the interest of the perfection of human life. In order to be free from all families' encumbrances and devote oneself 100% in the devotional service of Lord Krishna, 
The system is always recommended for everyone because it is the path of authority. The Lord instructs in the Bhagavad Gita 1862 that one must become a devotee of the Lord at least at the last stage of one's life. A sincere soul of the Lord, like Maharaj Yudhishthir, must abide by his instructions of the Lord for his own interest. The specific words Brahma Param indicate Lord Sri Krishna. This is corroborated in the Bhagavad Gita 10.13 by Arjuna with reference to great authorities like Asita, Devala, Narada and Vyasa. Thus, Maharaj Yudhishthir, while leaving home for the north, constantly remembered Lord Sri Krishna within himself, following in the footsteps of his forefathers, as well as the great devotees of all times. Again, the verse. Idichim pravivesha sham katapur vangmahat mabihi ridi brahma parangyayan Navarteta Yatogata. He, King Yudhishthir, he then started towards the north, treating the path accepted by his forefathers and great men, to devote himself completely to the thought of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And he lived in that way wherever he went. Oma Jnana Timirandasya Jnananjana Shalakaya Chakshu Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gavinoha Jaya Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Radha Shri Vasudhi Gaura Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So this chapter is called The Pandavas Retire Timely and it is described how the Pandavas, the five brothers, when they became older, they leave, they left their kingly palace, Hastinapura, and they constantly proceeded to the north into the Himalayan mountains. So it is described later in the Mahabharata that they walked and walked and walked and at one time, one point of time, one of the Pandavas collapsed and he went back to Godhead and afterwards the next one and finally All the Pandavas, they left their bodies at this walk. So, quite dramatic, I think. Suppose we decide, let's say, tomorrow we go just to the north. <laughs> at one point we will, if we make it, we will reach the east, east sea. Baltikum. So then we have to walk into the into the waves, and that's it. It's too cold. But here we see these great devotees. They had the spirit at one point. They were so. Of course, we can only do this when our mind is completely absorbed and determined to go back to Godhead and to leave this world. That is only possible if we have no attachment to this world. Otherwise, how, how this will be possible? If we are still attached, then let's say after 15 kilometers, we will, we will think, oh, maybe I should return. Maybe I should, uh, I don't know, did I forgot? switch off my my light or <laughs> something we sometimes had this problem when this is a running gag but sometimes it's also not 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 so not so funny we drive to our next 
preaching destination like Berlin. And after 20 kilometers, one of us <laughs> asked each other, did you really switch off the stove? And it happened that sometimes we, we were so uh, unsure that we returned, <laughs> finding out that the stove was properly switched off. <laughs> so when you go to the north, you cannot think, did I switch off the stove? And that is quite an insignificant attachment. <laughs> so, yeah, so um, we also hear in this verse that the Pandavas, mm. leading by, led by King Yudhishthir, they were not the first one who practiced this procedure or ritual, but it is said here that even before great kings and great devotees of the Lord, they already uh, did this before, so they just followed their example. It is said in the Bhagavad Gita, Yat yat a charati shreshtas tatat evetaro janaha sayat pramanam kurute lokastat anuvatate. Whenever there is a great personality doing something, the uh, general public they will think, oh, this person did this, maybe I should also do that. So this is a psychological um, dynamic. So the Pandavas, they knew that they belonged to a great dynasty of kings who were all pure devotees of the Lord. There were kings like, for instance, King Bharata. Mm -hmm. It is also described in the Srimad Bhagavatam. He was a very great king, very powerful, but also very nice devotee, a gentleman. We hear this word gentleman. And to give a, a good example, he decided when he was, I don't know, not, not that old. He was not that old. He delivered his kingdom to his children. And it is also said that these kings, they did not announce tomorrow or this night I will leave the kingdom. But no, they, in the pitch dark of the night, they sneaked out of the palace. I think they prepared their escape. Maybe they had some, you know, special robes so that nobody can recognize them. And next morning, it is said that the king, the Vedic kings, they were all woke, wake, they were all waken up by, by professional um, singers. And they glorified the deeds of the king. You are such a great king, you did this, yakya, and you helped the poor people. And they sing the glories to wake this king up softly, remind him uh, uh, of his virtues, and then the king, he was in a good mood and he continued with his good reign. But then they found out, they opened the door and <coughs> the bed was empty and nobody could find the king. So that was, that was the custom of these great personalities and um, yeah, I think this is the main, the core point here of this verse. Yeah, so are there any questions or comments? Maybe I'm uh, jumping ahead a little bit from the past time, but it is said that when Maharaj Yudhishthira did leave his body, he had to visit the hellish planets for a short moment. 
And I was always wondering, how can it be that a devotee who was so virtuous, and, and not just virtuous, not just dharmic, but really surrendered to Krishna and acting for the pleasure of the Lord, how he could suffer like this, or why he was forced to experience this? Maybe you can elaborate a little bit. Okay. I would say in advance <clears throat> that we have to be a little bit careful because there are so many Mahabharata versions around and some stories are really can make us mm, what is the correct word confuse us so there are stories which are, this is our standard, not exactly in accordance to the message of the Srimad Bhagavatam and the Bhagavad Gita. Srila Madhvacharya, one of the great Acharyas of the Vaishnava tradition, he said that in Kali Yuga there are only two scriptures we can fully trust. We can 100% trust. And these two scriptures are the Srimad Bhagavatam and the Bhagavad Gita. No verse is twisted, no verse is thrown out, no verse is afterwards included. So it, he said other scriptures, even the other Puranas and Mahabharata versions, we cannot be 100% um, uh, uh, confident or sure that everything is 100% is, uh, all right. So our, our standard is, is the story deviating from the message of the Srimad Bhagavatam, if we can if if we can adjust it, then it's okay. But if it is something that is totally speaking against the message of the Bhagavata, then we we, we are allowed to reject this um, episode or this passage. So coming back to your question, um, I have heard about of this story, and as far as I remember, there was a situation during the battle battle of Kurukshetra, where King Yudhishthir was requested by Lord Krishna to speak a lie. So, King Yudhishthir. He was famous of never having, never have spoken any lies all his lifetime. I don't know about us here. Who of us never in his lifetime spoke a lie? <laughs> I'm, I'm teaching young children in school. And this is every second day, this is the topic. Did you spoke this lie? <laughs> and they became angry on each other because they found out some of the children again have spoken a lie. <laughs> so, um, yeah, Yudhishthir was, was famous of not having, having spoken a lie and the result is when you don't, when you, if you don't speak a lie, you can even uh, gather mystic powers. We can gather mystic powers by this kind of virtue behave, virtuous behavior. So the result was that, well, it is said that Maharaj Shudishthir, he never really touched the ground. People, they were not sure, is he, is he really touching the ground? They were speculating, no, not really. Or, or yes. So, in some in some way, King Yudhishthir, that can happen. It is also said in the Bhagavad Gita, when we are very much emerged in the so-called mode of goodness, 
mode of sattva guna. It can happen that we can become pr proud. Oh, I'm so virtuous. I'm so. Uh, I'm such a good person. So there was a. It is said there was a slight um, contamination, which is interesting because sat sattva guna should be without contamination. But when it is still on the material platform, the sattva guna, there is some material, uh, we will find sooner or later some material contamination by the other modes. First, when we are on the transcendental platform, 100% Krishna conscious, then our sattva guna becomes shuddha sattva. So, in this situation, it was that there was a big, a very uh, furious fighter on the other side. He was also the guru of the Pandavas, the, the warrior guru. His name was Dronacharya. And he had a son called Ashvatthama, who also played a very... Um, very interesting role also in the Bhagavatam in the first canto we have one whole chapter describing a very big sin that Ashwatthama committed it. but as we know although Ashwatthama was not a very um, noble person <coughs> still the father was very attached to him that is that we find out even Dhritarashtra was very King Dhritarashtra was very attached to Duryodhana although everybody could see that Duryodhana had all bad qualities so he was very attached to his son but he was fighting very furious and very uh, powerful he shot a lot of arrows and many people died on the other side, on the side of Arjuna and Krishna and King Yudhishthir. And they could not stop him. He was so powerful. There was only one, one uh, method to somehow stop his um, prowess. And that was to break his moral, to break his... Um, enthusiasm and that was only possible that was Krishna's um, idea we have to tell him something that that is so devastating for him that he will lose all his enthusiasm and thus his his uh, might his power so he um, Lord Krishna he then approached King Yudhishthir, I don't know, uh, in the morning before the, the next battle started, or maybe within the battle, that would be interesting to find out, but somehow he approached King Yudhishthir, you have to speak a lie, you have to, you have to call out to Dronacharya, you your son Ashwatthama has been killed, <laughs> although that was a lie. And when he, when he hears that information, that would be that big devastation. So when King Yudhishthir heard this request, I should speak a lie, Haribol? I have never spoken a lie during my whole lifetime. I am famous in all the three worlds. And people say, I, I, will, I won't even touch the ground. So this is not possible. So then, uh, yeah, but, but this, the whole war will be dependent on that lie, maybe, probably. So. King Yudhishthir, who was also a very 
um, dedicated devotee of Lord Krishna, he was in a dilemma. On one side, he wanted to fulfill the request of Lord Krishna. On the other side, he wanted to um, be a 100% virtuous person. So he was um, thinking, how can we solve this problem? And then at one point, he decided, OK, I will, I will keep the, the words, your son, very soft. Maybe he can't hear. And I will say the elephant. There was also an elephant called Ashwatthama. And he called during the battle, Dronacharya, Dronacharya, Ashwatthama, the elephant, has died. <laughs> So that was actually true. There, were, there was an elephant called Ashwatthama and he died. And he hoped that Dronacharya just heard Ashwatthama and the devastation was uh, already so big that he <coughs> could not hear the elephant. So Lord Krishna, he knew he's in the heart of every person. He knew that this was the solution that King Yudhishthira uh, chalked out for himself. And he arranged that some other big warrior, exactly at <coughs> the point when the word the elephant, someone blew in his um, conch very loudly. So Dronacharya could not hear the elephant. He just could hear Ashwatthama has died. And he was, oh my God. And first he thought, this cannot be. Ashwatthama, he's too powerful. I, I personally taught him all the, how to use the, the most uh, powerful weapons. This cannot be true. But, oh my God, King Yudhishthir is saying this. And everybody knows <coughs> when he speaks, it will never be a lie. So that was then the reason why uh, Dronacharya became devastated. He, he collapsed in grief, and they could kill him, finally. So again, back, coming back to his question is that because it is said because King Yudhishthira Hare Krishna was not fully surrendering to the instructions of Lord Krishna, he had when he gave up his body, he have to he had to visit hell, but just not you know not experiencing any, you know, punishments, but just seeing the hellish realms, which is not very, not a very nice experience. Just to see hell is very ugly. So, but that was, according to some Mahabharata versions, that was the, the reason why he, on the way to the heavenly planets and to the spiritual world, he had to make a turn, you know, like when we drive to the very nice quarters of Berlin, I think Dahlem is a very nice uh, place in Berlin, we have to make a turn, what is the most, um, which, which uh, part of Berlin has the most, the baddest reputation? So the, so the taxi driver makes a turn to Marzahn and Kreuzberg, and then he goes to Dahlem. And we, see, we have to see these, these uh, places. Or I think in Mumbai there are very nice um, uh, uh, mansions of billionaires, and someone picks up at, up at the airport, and we gave him the address, I don't know, Biela, Mr. Biela, and uh, this uh, mansion with nice swimming pool. But the, the taxi driver 
he uh, he drives first to the slum of Mumbai. I think this there is the biggest <laughs> slum in the world is in Mumbai, and we have to see all the uh, poor people there. And after oh, that, we you? go to that place. So, okay, uh, so I hope Sadashiva will be satisfied with the answer. <laughs> Sadashiva, are you satisfied with my yes. answer? Yes. <laughs> Sorry, I missed the last little bit, but thank you. That's clear. <laughs> Can I ask you? But if you say that uh, only for this little uh, thing, Mahatma here has who has to go to the hell. Yeah, that's, I mean, what about me, for example? Uh, yeah. But we have, to, we have to understand, he does not go to hell, yeah, yeah, literally. He's, he's so, yeah. He was visiting it just like a tourist. Like a tourist. Oh, this is how hell looks like, not very nice place. Yeah, but I mean, it's like for, for, for us, I remember how many lies I told to people, how many things I did, and I mean, I mean, there is no ch chance. Yeah, then maybe, no, because um, Krishna wanted to use King Yudhishthira as an example that to fulfill the order of Krishna is always even superior than to speak mundane lies. We can speak mundane, or we can speak lies if it is within the devotional service of Krishna. Even then, this is on a higher level. My assumption is this should be the teaching for all of us, that when it comes, and it, it might be in our life that we have to decide, are we, do I want to serve Krishna now, but that means I have to speak a lie, or do, do I want to be a nice person within this material world, but then making compromises regarding the devotional service. Mm -hmm. That is the message, and therefore maybe for us that this looks a little bit drastic. So sometimes Krishna um, puts the circumstances in a very drastic way to give us a good teach, a, a good lesson. <coughs> Can I ask you one question more? Yeah, that I think it's more or less practical question. That, for example, as we see, five pandavas they always was. Uh, engage in the process of devotional service, and I mean, they were the kings, and that is a lot of service, like we do in the temple service, it's also, but every devotee, he has, like, external service and internal, external and internal services, and we are chanting the holy name, yeah, external, we are preaching, and we do service in the temple, and, uh, but in my case, it's when I do service, external, like, do for, the temple and then communicate with people and then I come to my place and start to chant for example and then I th I'm thinking about this service in the temple and it's disturbing my chanting I see how it's like I cannot concentrate some dialogues come to my mind I make this with people and I see that I want to just hearing the holy name but no possible I need like one two weeks get out of that uh, and then peaceful mind, uh, yeah, my mind become peaceful, and then I can start to chant again. I don't know, maybe you can share your experience and give me the advice, what can I do with that? So if I have understood correctly, yeah. you are chanting in the morning, but thinking about how should I decorate the altar? Some kind of, yeah. will cook. <laughs> I would say this is not the worst scenario. It is quite good when we chant, and it, is, it can even be a sign of good chanting that we start to think about how we want to serve <coughs> Krishna in practice. It's maybe even better than there are, it can also be that we chant 16 rounds, 
and afterwards we we lie whole day on the sofa and do nothing for Krishna, for Krishna. <laughs> or, or even or, or watch television the whole day. Yeah? So better than to chant and yeah, when 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 thoughts of devotional service more or less force into our consciousness. I, I think you should not be too much worried about this. And I cannot put my hand into fire, but I think I have heard an anecdote that one disciple of Srila Prabhupada gave a similar concern to Srila Prabhupada. And Srila Prabhupada said, me too sometimes, me too. <coughs> no, Sadashiva, can you, have you remembered? No. So Srila Prabhupada was um, uh, sympathizing that this is, this, this even happened to me. Yeah. Yeah? So of course we should, we should uh, try to <coughs> listen to the holy name, mm, but Another strategy is you have a little note paper and a pen, and if there is something, how much flowers do we need? Was it 12 or was it 15? Um, and then you remember 12. So you write it down, and then it is out of your mind. It is really, this is really working for yeah. sci scientific um, proof. So we, you can try this. But how is your experience? But I mean, but you know the, the proper mood of the chanting when you get into the holy name, just you, you don't hearing anything, you're just hearing the holy name and nothing in your mind. You, you even out of your mind and you can, you can see this is my mind, it's, it doesn't matter. I just now with the, holy, with the holy name. And I mean, it is totally different feeling when your mind engages in the process of chanting and when mind is out of the process. And that's, I mean, sometimes like I feel that, yeah, it's okay, I mean, it's devotional service, but it's disturbing the proper chanting. That's, that's my problem. <laughs> if I may offer a, a thought there. Why are you chanting? Do you want to enjoy chanting the holy name or do you want to serve Krishna by chanting the holy name? And when we serve the holy name, what happens? Our mind becomes purified, thoughts come up. So maybe it's like Krishna helping you to clarify those situations and that's why they come up. So what can we do? We can then turn those thoughts to Krishna and say, Krishna, this is the thought I'm having. Why are we are chanting? Why? This is the thought I'm having now. This is the conversation I'm thinking about the service. Please help me. This is also service, <coughs> because Sajjana <coughs> Swami once said, what, what do we do when we're chanting? We're asking for service. Mm -hmm. So when the service arises, do we say no and keep chanting, or do we do what we asked for? You know, Krishna is giving you an opportunity to serve. So, and like this you can, you can uh, combine those two things. It's not now I'm chanting and now I'm doing service, or now I'm thinking about something, but it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. It happens at the same time. And... Um, so this dichotomy of I'm doing something practical and chanting, maybe this is where the difficulty comes from. When you try to in your in your mind and in your understanding combine those things. Chanting is the same thing like cleaning the floor. And cleaning the floor can be the same thing like chanting if the if the mood is there. It's it's the same it's the same thing. When I'm when I'm doing service, I'm doing it and asking Krishna, please let me serve some more. Mm -hmm. and this is what I do when I'm chanting. And uh, yeah, Prabhupada explained, no? Like you, you drop the stone in the in the lake and all the, the dirt comes up. This is what happens when we start chanting. So the mind gets purified, so we can be grateful to Krishna. Thank you for bringing this to my attention. And then, yeah, write it down and, and uh, you have something to, to work on later on. So mm -hmm. I, I would, this always works for me. Be, be grateful for what comes to mind. Not, I mean, material thoughts is a different story, but when it's connected to Krishna, it's, I'm grateful that Krishna is bringing something to my attention. I see it as a response from Krishna. That's a good idea, thank you, Shri Prabhupada. But 
I am confused a bit because I am thinking that the chanting by itself it is already the, the, the best service what we can do for Krishna. Or, or, or I, uh, sorry, <laughs> who am I should ask? <laughs> Those are the, the experts, sorry. <laughs> I mean, if you chant Krishna, if we, if we, if we clean the kitchen, it's good, but I mean, yeah, I'm, yeah, the, this should be the mood the, the, of devotional service. But. I would, uh, I okay. would uh, follow in the footsteps of Sadashiva's arguments. Our, the mantra is, Dear Lord Krishna, Dear Srimati Radharani, please accept me in your devotional service. Devotional. So why, why make such a hard um, die Spaltung, Trennung, no. division. Division, division between those two? So as we know, there are great devotees like Ambarish Maharaj, he fully understood that all of his <coughs> devotional service are on the absolute platform, like cleaning the floor of the temple, like embracing the, the bodies of the devotees. There's a, a list of what he all, the, to smell the fragrance of the Tulasi flowers that were offered to Krishna, there's a list. And of course, in our age, Mm. Um, the chanting of the holy name, especially in our age, is the is our in most cases our starting point. The purification of our tongue. Um, most of us, we came to Krishna consciousness first listening to the holy name. Then someone gave us a mantra card, and we. Hare Krishna. And then someone gave us uh, a, a plate of burfis. So our the devotional service often starts with our tongue. That is also said by Srila Rupa Goswami. And then when our tongue becomes purified, we all the other um, devotional practices they follow automatically. So therefore we stress so much on the chanting and hearing process, because it is the f foundation. Um, we can do other devotional services, but when we when we um, when we skip or when we reduce our chanting and hearing process, then it is very difficult for long for a long time to keep us in the devotional spirit. We might, at one point, we might wonder what I am doing all this sweeping here. So when we start, when we stop chanting our rounds in the morning and listening to the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, listening to, to our, also to our philosophy, then at one point we sweep the floor. I'm sorry, we or we cook, and we forget for whom we, I am sweeping the floor, for whom I am cooking. Um, who, who is this? He is just a normal person. Why should I offer my obeisances? Mm -hmm. So therefore we so much st stress on a regular um, pr uh, practice of chanting. And of course, you are right. We should endeavor as much as we can to to concentrate on the holy name, but when the result is devotional thoughts, not you know television thoughts or I don't know who is the next um, soccer champion, then uh, but if there are thoughts like how how much flowers do we need for for decorating the um, the altar, no? we can count here now. <laughs> so. So then, uh, you should not be too much worried. Thank you. May I ask a follow-up question to my first question? Um, I was wondering, is it that Krishna is putting Maharaj Yudhishthira to a different standard than us? Because as, as Dauji was asking, you know, the 
if Yudhishthir, for one lie, he has to see hell, what of us then? That is like, you know, we don't want to think about our future. So is it because Maharaj Yudhishthir is such a great devotee? Is he, for, is he held up to a different standard than we are because Krishna knows we will never be able to, to live up to something like that? Or how would you think? Well, we also have the, the story of Arjuna on the battlefield of Kurukshetra. And as we know, at the Vedic times, the Kshatriyas, they had the spirit, I will fight now for Dharma, and I will do my duty. And suddenly, they saw one fighter, a very famous fighter, he was getting shaky, he started to cry, and even he uh, dropped his famous Gandiva bow. bow. So we could say, wow, is he, is he the weakest warrior on this battlefield? Do the other warriors do the same? No, there is no, only one who is doing this. So at the, first at the first glance, we might think, if we are not very intelligent, oh, Arjuna is maybe the weakest fighter, the weakest Kshatriya. But then when we understand, oh, now Sri Krishna is speaking the Bhagavad Gita, which is famous in all the three worlds, and Arjuna is the receptor of the Bhagavad Gita, then the whole um, vision, the whole perspective changes. <coughs> so therefore, yes, sometimes Krishna puts his pure devotees in, in more drastic circumstances um, than normal living entities. Um, also to give them more glories. So, therefore, I I wouldn't think. Oh, if he sees hell, what will what will uh, happen to me? I don't think that should be our most biggest concern. We can say, wow, even Lord, uh, even Maharaj Yudhishthira, he visited hell. What is the message? Mm. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So thank you very much for your attention. Shimad Bhagavatam, Grantarat, Shimad Bhagavatam, Ki Jai. Shila Prabhupada, Ki Jai. Gita Goda, Pimana, Ki Jai.